Isaiah 61, if you have a Bible, let's go there. If not, we'll put it on the board. This is our springboard scripture for a 15-week journey that we're on about the joy of the Lord. And I want to read this together, if you don't mind. Is that okay? Everybody participating, let's read together. Verse 1, ready, read. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and the release from darkness for the prisoners, the opening of the proclaim, I'm sorry, I thought I was going to say something, it didn't. <laughs> to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a what? Crown of beauty for ashes, the oil of what? The oil of what? Somebody shout the oil of joy instead of mourning. This is a season where God wants to take the sadness, depression, and mourning away from you and give you an anointing of joy. If you believe that, say amen. amen. Today we're on part number two of a 15-part movement of the joy of the Lord called the drip. Everybody shout the drip. drip. And my prayer for every person who is a part of a live church and for those of you all who follow us online, is that by the end of these 15 weeks, you will be dripping in joy. Somebody shout, I'm dripping in joy. I'm dripping in joy. I've had people already tuning in from North Carolina, a friend from South Carolina, and they're waking up in the middle of the night, tuning in to what we're doing, talking about how this, there's an infusion of joy, even online, that people are receiving states away. How much more us who is in the atmosphere. And so how many of you all believe and agree with that statement that you're dripping in joy. I want you to position yourself to receive the gift of joy, the oil of joy, to receive the joy of the Lord. Somebody say, I'm dripping in joy. How many of you all were here last week for week number one? Anybody was here? Okay. Now, if you wasn't, you want to make sure that you get on our podcast, the church app, the, on the YouTube channel, because last week was a foundation that we need for the whole 15-week journey. Okay. Last week, we talked about what the oil of joy is because some of you all will hear about the oil of joy and think I'm talking about Jerry Curl juice, and that ain't what I'm talking about. You might think I'm talking about them oils that some of y'all be peddling. You know how you peddle. My wife peddles those oils. It's like frankincense and myrrh and all this stuff. She'd be like, sniff that before you go to bed and it'll make, it'll make you sleep better. I'd be like, all right. Um, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the oil. That was last night. It really was. <laughs> The oil of joy, somebody say the oil of joy, which is an anointing of joy. I'm not talking about natural joy, we're talking about supernatural joy. And there is something that's so powerful and unique about this series. I'm so glad you're here. I was asking my wife after service last week, I said, hey, how was the word? What did you get out of it? She says there was this crazy presence of God on it. She was like, when you were walking, I could see the presence of God moving with you on stage. She says, as I was sitting there in the front row, she said, I had my pen in my hand and I could almost feel like dropping my pen and falling out under the power of God. And she says, I don't know what that really means, but I believe that people are going to be healed just sitting under the word of God in this series. Does anybody believe that, that people are going to be healed just under the word? And so... After I left, I called Pastor Aaron at our Gainesville campus, and I was like, Pastor Aaron, man, I know we did a satellite. We used technology. How was it for you? You know, I wasn't there live. He says there was something that was so powerful and unique. It was like, it wasn't that people were super happy. There was this anointing of joy, and it was just like the presence of God was just so thick in the atmosphere. And so I don't know exactly what God is doing in this series, but I will say that he wants to confirm his word with signs following. If you're ready for that, somebody say, I'm ready. I'm ready. And so the Lord showed me in this series that this series would be like um, uh, what was necessary to get us to a certain place in him. And they're almost like building blocks. So this week we're going to put a block on. Next week is going to be a block, not week number nine, week number 10. And you don't want to miss a block. And I believe with all my heart that God is calling our church to put more honor on the house and more honor on his word. Yes. Now, I need to say that personally. You say, it seems like he's talking about me. Yes, I am. I'm talking directly to you today. That it is time for us to put more honor on his house and more honor on his word. We live in a generation where people are very flippant in their church attendance. Like they might come and they might not. They say after the pandemic, before the pandemic, the average Christian came to church 1.7 times a month. Now the average Christian comes 1.2 times but you need the other times for significant breakthrough and for God to use you. That's like you showing up at the gym once a month thinking you're going to come out buff. That ain't going to work that way, baby. 
It's like you go into the second grade, but you skip the third and the fourth grade, show them at the sixth grade, and you don't even know how to add. There's just something about being in the right place at the right time. All I'm saying is that, listen to me. I don't know what you got going on on Sundays, but for me, Sunday is a Sabbath day. And I'm going to keep that separate from everything else. I'm not saying that you can't go on vacation. I'm not saying you got to do other things, but a lot of people got to flip a coin mentality on Sunday. Heads, we go to church. Tails, I'm sleeping in. Don't do that. You don't do that when it comes to work. Heads, I'm going to work. Tails, I ain't. No, you don't do that. Why? Because you know that if you don't go to work, you don't get paid. And if you don't pay, babies don't eat. And the same thing spiritually. If you don't come to church, you're not getting fed spiritually so that you can have victory in your life. God is saying, put an honor on my house and put an honor on his word. And when I'm talking about putting an honor on his word, you need to take the Bible home and read it. Like have a relationship with scriptures yourself. Don't just take my word on it. Go home and meditate on these things day and night. I got to get off of it. I ain't supposed to stay there. I got to move on. Somebody say move on. But did you hear what I'm saying though? My name is Ken and I'm your friend. I'm just trying to help you today. So let's define joy. Um, recap very quickly. Natural joy in the, dic in the dictionary is the emotion evoked by well-being, success, or good fortune, or by the prospect of possessing what we desire. This is natural joy. Somebody say natural joy. This is that, that good feeling that you get when you eat your favorite food. That's, that, it it feels good, but it's natural joy. This is when you fall in love after all them years of you being single. You're happy, but that's, it's, it's, it's real natural. It's when the investors finally come through and invest in your company and give you the money that they've been talking about, and you feel good. But it, and, it feel, it, and that's good, but it's natural. It's just natural. It's not evil. It's not bad, but it's natural. That's not what we're talking about over this 15-week journey. We are not talking about natural joy, people of God. We are talking about supernatural joy. So write this definition down for the joy of the Lord, a.k.a. supernatural joy, a.k.a. the oil of joy, a.k.a. Jesus joy. It is choosing to respond to external circumstances with inner contentment and satisfaction. Have you got there yet? Because we know that God will use these experiences to accomplish his work in our lives. That's where we're going. If I had to define it even more, I would say the joy of the Lord is a supernatural transaction we experience with God. It's the soul deep assurance that no matter what we face, God will carry us through. The joy of the Lord, please write this down, you note takers, is twofold. The joy of the Lord is a fruit and the joy of the Lord is a gift. It is a fruit that you must develop and it's a gift that you must receive. Are y'all with me today? As many of you guys know, 2021 last year was the hardest year for me and my wife. Tabitha and I, we've been married for 23 years. And we've been through a lot of ups and downs um, together, but last year was a whole lot of downs. You know, uh, many of you all know that she was diagnosed with, um, with uh, stage three breast cancer um, at the end of 2020. So 2021, she went through a double mastectomy and five months of chemotherapy and 30 rounds of radiation. And sometimes I can tell that story and you just hear like, oh, that was no big thing because, you know, Tabitha and I, we're people of faith. And so we know how to faith it till we make it. And we can still go through our life and kind of put a smile on our face, but I really need you to hear my pain in this. We didn't just have some surgeries, we had multiple surgeries. She didn't just have a double mastectomy, she also had a hysterectomy. For females, you guys know that she had an estrogen-related breast cancer, so they wanted to remove the ovaries and all the female stuff. And so um, then that put her over into, hot, uh, into menopause. And so she has hot flashes at 45 years old. And it's not like natural menopause that naturally happens in a woman. It went from this to that overnight, so her body's like tripping. Not only is it affecting her sleep, it was affecting our intimate life, it's affecting our marriage life, it's affecting our finances. I, I just need you to feel my pain. Because sometimes you're going through pain and you feel like you're the only one. And I need you to understand that you can still walk by faith in the middle of pain. You can still be who God's called you to be even though you're in the middle of, oh, come on, somebody. You can still, you can still obey God's word. So you got two choices. Either pain going to send you to your knees or it's going to send you back to the club. What, what is your choice? It's going to send you back to the bottle. It's going to send you back online looking for love in the wrong places. Could please ask your neighbor, what is your choice? Which one is, which one is it? I need to know who I'm dealing with today. I need to know what you're going to do with your pain. For me, I'm going to pray and I'm going to fast and I'm going to believe God, but some people are going to try to smoke it away and puff, puff. I don't need that kind of church that when you go through a storm, messes up your life and your walk with God. 
I need people that understand that the pressing is for greater oil, the crushing of the grape is for new wine. We're going somewhere today. Go ahead and tell your neighbor you're going to be glad you came to church today. In the middle of my greatest pain, a dark moment. I'm not even going to give you all the details, okay? Just say painful. We were doing everything we knew to do, having communion together daily, quoting the Word of God, still doing what we can, you know, to stand on the Word. I would get up every day and I would pray and I would kind of walk around my neighborhood. I had this trail that I would go on and I would go to this lake and I would just journal and I would just talk to God. I would just quote scriptures. I would do this every day. Came one day, I was leaving my place of prayer and I don't know how to articulate this, but I'm going to do the best I can because this movement is based upon this experience. I had an encounter with the presence of God and it was almost like the Holy Spirit supernaturally put joy in my spirit. It was almost like an infusion. In my darkest moment, when I was in the valley of the shadow of death, I didn't fear any evil for God was with me. And it was like an infusion of joy, not on the mountaintop, but in the valley. Not in the a.m., but in the p.m. Not when things were going good, but when things were going bad. There was an encounter that I had with God that he gave me peace that passed understanding, meaning that it didn't make any sense of why I was happy. All of a sudden, I became lighthearted. All of a sudden, I wanted to tell more jokes. All of a sudden, I, 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 had, uh, I, I, had, I had a careless attitude. Matter of fact, my wife asked me, she says, do you even care? I said, sweetheart, of course I care. I've just learned to cast my cares to the one that cares for both of us more than I could ever care. And this is my announcement for you guys. If that's not just for me, that's available for anybody who wants it. That oil of joy is available for anybody who wants it. And I'm telling you, it's not just for a season. That thing lasts for a couple of months. I'm telling you that this is available for us as a lifestyle. 24-7, 365, we get the opportunity to walk in the anointing of joy. Does anybody want that today? If you want that, you're in the right room. And so today's segment, part number two, is called Joy in a Jam. Joy in a Jam. And I want to talk to you today, and I want to give you the secrets of counting it all joy. <laughs> I want to speak to you about walking in joy when life is difficult. Walking in joy when there's pressure and pain. Walking in joy in the hard places. I want to speak to you today about having joy in the jam. It's easy to have joy when you get some ice cream and a new car and a promotion. I want you to have joy even in the midst of the valley of the shadow of death. And I don't know if you know this or not, but God has never promised us an easy life. Ain't nobody saying nothing. Did you know that? There is no promise in Scripture that God is going to remove all of your pain and give you an easy life. Actually, the Bible says the opposite. Y'all ready? Yeah. Psalms 34 says it this way. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. Okay, hold on, hold on, hold on. <clears throat> not a few, not several, but many are the afflictions. That means trouble and hardship. And it says many are the afflictions of the righteous, not the wicked. I expect bad stuff to happen to bad people. But it doesn't say that. It says many are the problems, hardships, troubles, afflictions of the... But I love the end game. But the Lord delivers him out of them, not out of some of them, not out of a few of them. This is a promise that you need to take to the heavenly bank. God wants to deliver us out of them. I want to talk to you about having joy in a jam today. Not when things are easy, not when everything goes your way. I want to talk about the joy of the Lord, which is your strength. If you go to Matthew chapter 5, watch this one. The Bible actually says the opposite. And I want to normalize your difficulties today. It says, Matthew 5, here it comes. Blessed are you when people insult you. Okay, hold on, hold on. <laughs> we starting weird today. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Okay, y'all look this way. Did y'all read that? The Bible says blessed, that means happy, fortunate. When people are lying on you at work, when people are ridiculing you and slandering your name and making up stuff about you, sometimes I get online and it's amazing the trolls that are on my feed talking about what I said and they wasn't even in the meeting. You're taking a 30 second clip judging my life. I don't, you know how I say that one thing about how um, 
I got saved when I was 11. For 10 years, I lived as a Christian atheist. I had a lady online tell me that I had a false conversion, and I really didn't get saved. I'm like, how are you going to judge my 11-year-old happy-go-lucky self, right? And sometimes you can see that and almost get upset. To me, that's confirmation that I be with God. That's confirmation. See, when people persecute you and lie about you, it's not because you're doing anything wrong. It's because you're doing everything. Oh. All right, I'm going to make sure I got the right church. How many of you all have ever been persecuted because of your faith? Family members don't understand you. People talking about you in a cult, all that kind of stuff. That ain't something wrong. That means everything right, baby. Okay, okay, watch this. If you have never been persecuted because of your faith, maybe, just maybe, your light ain't shining bright enough. Because people misunderstanding you, ridiculing you, and insulting you because of your love for Jesus is normal. And we need to normalize persecution as if something strange is happening to us. Ain't nothing strange happening to me. That means that I'm anointed. That means I got favor. That means greater is he that is in me than he that... Ain't nothing wrong with this, baby. Everything is right with it. But watch what it says. It says, blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you falsely, say all evil against you because of me. And then it gives us the attitude to have. He says, rejoice and be glad. <laughs> Some of y'all get mad and sad. You ain't thinking nothing about rejoicing and being glad. It says, have joy. It's basically what it means. Because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets that were before you. Oh, you're in the right place today. I want to talk to somebody about having joy in a jam. You're saying, Pastor Ken, are you telling me that I'm going to have trouble? In my life, well, I'm not saying that. I'm just quoting what the Bible says. John 16, 33. I don't know if you've seen this before. You guys look like Bible students. But John 16, 33, it says, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace because in this world you're going to have what? I'm just saying what the Bible says. I wish that it wasn't so. I wish that we never had a problem. Nobody ever talked bad about us. I never had to overcome a sickness. I never had to deal with crazy people in traffic. I wish we all could get along. Come on, Rodney King. <laughs> but the Bible says this. In Jesus, you'll have peace. And I love the next sentence, in the middle of trouble. You can have peace in trouble. You can have peace when you have Jesus, even if you're in trouble. And it says, in this world, this system, this social system that we're in right now, this side of heaven, we're going to have trouble. Then he tells us to take heart. Go ahead and tell your neighbor, say, you're going to have to take heart. No, you ain't tell, you, you, what that mean? You got to man up. Go ahead and tell three people around you, say, you're going to have to man up. You can't be no sissy Christian here. You're going to have to man up. You're going to have to get some boldness in your faith. Come on, somebody. You're going to have to get a backbone for what you believe, because if not, you're going to get on the History Channel online. Somebody's going to tell you your Bible ain't real, and they are a liar, and the truth ain't in them. You're going to have to take heart. Why? Because I've overcome the world. So because I'm with Jesus and he's overcome the world, we also world overcomers. Do I got any world over conquer, overcomers and conquerors that are in this church today? And so what I want, I want to do, I want to help you normalize difficulties. Because the Bible never says that we won't have problems. It just says he's going to be with us in the problems. He's going to give us crazy grace. And so here's the conclusion. The Bible never tells us we won't have troubles. He gives us the attitude and the posture that we should have when we face them. And this brings me to like the center point of my message. If you're ready, say I'm ready. ready. And it's James chapter 1, verse number 2. And James 1 is going to be pivotal for somebody who is in this place today because it's going to give you the posture and the attitude you need for what you're facing. Let's read this together. Verse number 2, it says, my brethren, ready girl, my brethren, Count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith, read together, produces patience. Verse 4, but let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete and, ooh, let's read that again. I don't know if they got it. Somebody's on Twitter right now when you should be listening to me. Let's read it one more time. Ready, go. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience, but let patience have its perfect work so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking no thing. How many of you all want to be perfect and complete, lacking nothing? You got to let patience have its perfect work. And some of the tests and the trials that you're in right now 
is to develop that fruit of patience on the inside of you. And so what James gives us is what we call the posture of what you do while you're waiting. Now, here's the deal. I love y'all. I do. I, I wouldn't want to do anything in my life other than ministry. I love to see disciples being made and people grow into everything God's called them to be. But what I've learned as a pastor over 15 years is that I can't live your life for you. And for some of you all, I would do a much better job than what you're doing, to be honest with you. <laughs> but I can't do it. I can only live my life in the Claytor household. My job is to be a coach. You never see a coach jumping in the game. The coach is stuck on the sideline. And he might be over there yelling at the players, but he, can, he can't get in the game. He's usually somebody who won the game before, so now he's qualified to coach. And he's telling his team how to run the plays, but really, they got to run them. And the only way they can win the championship is if they follow the instructions of their coach and go out and run the X's and O's. I wish I could take this class for you. But there's no teacher that when the test is given can jump over at the student's desk and say, to see, sees the answer. No, no, no. All the teacher can do is sit up at the front of the class and pray to God <laughs> that the students have went home and done their homework and they're ready for the test. The pastor would love to go home with you and fix your marriage, but I can't. I had to fix mine. I would love to go home and do your budget and put God at the top, but I can't, but God's at the top of my budget. All I can do is exemplify you, holy living from the pulpit, and encourage you every time you decide to show up to go home. My job is to get you battle ready. My job is to get you ready for the test, because the test is coming. I need you to know in 2023, you're going to be tested, and my job is to get you ready to pass the test of life, because they're going to come. It doesn't say if the trials come. It says when they come. And they're coming. And in the name of Jesus, you're going to pass tests like you ain't never passed them before this year. I do not believe, as a side note, that God puts evil on people. I don't believe that God has evil in him to put on anybody. But I do believe that God can take what the devil has meant for evil and turn it around and get some good out of it. And I don't know what your trial is. I don't know what you're going through. I just want you to know that God is not against you. God is for you. But he, in his infinite wisdom, can take what the devil has meant for evil and get good from it. I do not believe that God put cancer on my wife. I believe it was an attack of the devil to take her life out. But I also see how God is now turning it around. And now he's getting some good out of it all around the world. She's about to start her first book next month. Come on, somebody. God's turning stuff around. Hey, God can turn. Now we got a coffee shop called Barb's Coffee where 20% of the proceeds go to battling cancer and helping bring it to an end. Come on, somebody. We just did a series called The Prescription where we believe that God still heals. And we're seeing people getting healed from the effects of a stroke and back pain and knee pain because God is still in this place. Our pain pushed us into promise. Are you with me today? When we went through our cancer battle, God gave me a vision to lead 2 million people to Jesus over the next 20 years. It wasn't on the mountaintop that he spoke. It was in my dark season, in my dark day, when I was being fought by the devil. He was trying to destroy my marriage and destroy my ministry and destroy my wife. God says, no, we're going to turn this thing around. And I'm happy to announce to you today that just in 11 months, I'm talking about just this year. Somebody say, just this year, just this year, we as a church have been able to lead 4,835 people don't tell me he won't turn it around. Somebody better give him praise. Come on, somebody, don't tell me he won't turn your pain and push you into promise. And, and here, I got an, and, we're, and we're just getting started. We're going to put some zeros behind that. I want to see next time 40,835 people, 400,800, 4,000,000. You understand what I'm saying? We're just getting started, y'all. As soon as we get this Gideon's army really rose, risen up, yeah, I'm talking about you. I'm talking about you. You're kind of halfway here, halfway not. Halfway on fire for God, halfway on cold. You know what we call that, lukewarm. God has a way of spitting you out of his mouth. I don't even know what that means. Your lifestyle made God vomit. That's crazy. Uh, spit you out of his mouth. Lukewarm? Come on, we don't want to be that church. Come on, we want to be the church that's on fire for God. 
Do I got any God chasers in this place today? Do I got anybody that's all in? Anybody? Oh, has anybody said, I'm jumping all in this thing this year? Come on, I'm ready to serve and pray. It might just be me, but I'm ready to go. I'm ready to go. And so, this is what I believe. Maybe your thing ain't cancer, and I know I use that one a lot because that's my pain, okay? And sometimes you got to preach about your pain to help somebody else out. Take your mess and create a message. What you've been through, it's not just you, but, but watch this. The principles are universal. Maybe your thing hasn't been cancer. Maybe it's depression. God wants to take whatever the devil has meant for evil and turn it around and get some good from it. Maybe it's some kind of addiction, pornography, some kind of substance. I want you to know that God's ready to heal you and free you. He wants to take what the devil has meant for evil and turn it around and get some good. Maybe it's your marriage is hanging on by a thread. It's amazing to me the amount of people that are so desperate to get married and the amount of married people that are so desperate to end their marriage just because they do not know how to operate the gift that God has given them. I'm going to help you a little bit later. I want you to know that God wants to turn it around and he wants to get some good out of it. But you have to count it all joy. Count it all joy. Tell your neighbor, count it all joy. Count it all joy. Counting is an accountant term. It means that at the end of your life, you should be able to do the balance sheet and it equals joy. At the end of every day, you should be able to do the financial report. You should be able to look at my life and do the ledger and it will equal out. I will still count it. All joy. No matter what I go through, it is my choice. There's another translation. It doesn't use the word count. It used the word consider. And this is what consider means. It has to do with what you choose to do with what's presented to you. Come on in the back. Consider. It means what you choose to do with what's presented to you. Do you know that you have a choice to get sad or get glad? The choice is up to you. You have the power of choice. God says, I lay before you life and death, blessings and curses. You choose. You better choose your friends. You better choose what atmospheres you want to be in. You better choose to believe what God's word says. The choice is up to you. And I don't know about you, but I choose joy. I've chosen sadness, discouragement, and despair for too long. Today, I'm choosing joy. Every single day, no matter what I face, I'm getting up like it's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. A beautiful day in the neighborhood. And put my graphic up because the choice is up to you. And so some of you all, instead of choosing joy, you murmur and complain. Well, God, I've been believing you, and I've been walking with you, and blah, 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 blah. And you're like the children of Israel dying in the wilderness, even though you've been created for the promised land, because you murmur. Some of y'all blame shift. How many of y'all blame shifts? I know you're here. Yeah. We live in a generation of blame shifters. We love to blame everybody. We're blaming the Democrats today. Tomorrow, we're blaming the Republicans. We're blaming the white folks and the black folks. We're blaming the church, the church, the church. I can't stand the church. No, it's you. Quit blaming everybody. You've got to take some responsibility for ourselves. You know I'm preaching better than you saying amen. I ain't scared of none of y'all. <laughs> you can choose to be discouraged, depressed. Depression is like a label that the world is putting on everybody. Everybody's walking around depressed. Not me. I'm talking about even if you have a chemical imbalance, don't talk about it that much. Talk about how you got the joy of the Lord. Talk about how you're healed by the stripes of Jesus. Don't you dare let the world label you. I don't care what doctor you go to. I know a doctor that has never lost a patient. His name is Jesus, and he pays so that you, can't have, so you can have freedom. You can be worried. You can be fretful. You can be resentful. You can have animosity. You can be racist. You can be prejudiced. And racism goes all different ways. That ain't a white people to black people thing. That's a black people. Some of y'all black people prejudiced as can be. I see you on my social media. I'm like this bunch of black racists. <laughs> I'm serious. Racism is not a skin issue. It's a sin issue. And we got the answer to sin, and his name is Jesus. Because in this church, we got one race with different ethnicities, one race, the human race, where we worship God. I don't care your pigment or your melanin. I'm more than my melanin. Come on, somebody. Do I got any family in the house today? So I need you to choose. You're either going to do this, or you're going to have joy. It's your choice. Get a couple of people around you, push them and say, it's your choice. Every single day. No matter what you face. No matter how hard it is. Somebody shout, I choose joy. joy. Simply put, that your response in the trial is your responsibility. My pastor used to say it this way. Write this down. Your response is your responsibility. <laughs> Some of y'all are like, well, they made me mad. Can't nobody make you mad. You got mad. 
and your response is your responsibility. Offense is easy, y'all. It's easy to get offended nowadays. Who you think you are talking to me like that? <laughs> but your response is still your responsibility. And so how you handle the discouragement and the problems in your life and the routine and how mundane it is and you're waiting for your Boaz, your response is still your response. I'm coming for everybody today. I don't even care. So what do we learn from James? Number one, write this down, that trials are inevitable. It doesn't say when trials, if trials come, it says when they do. So my job is to get you battle ready, ready for the war. Mm -mm -mm. Number two, what do we learn from James? Write this down. Trials are building something in us that's much needed for us. They really are. Trials don't come to defeat you, but develop you. Trials do not come to break you, but actually they can make you. Are y'all with me today? Yeah. And number three, what do we learn from James? That trials should be met up front with the attitude of joy. They should be met up front, and that's your choice. We have to stop saying, I'm going to be happy. When? I'm going to be happy when I get that new job. I'm going to be happy when I pay off those bills and that debt. I'm going to be happy when I get married and find me somebody. I'm going to be happy when I finally had this baby. I'm eight months pregnant right now. I'm going to be happy. No, you're going to be up all night. No, I'm just, um, <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm going to be happy, you know, when they let me preach. I'm going to be happy. I'm going to be happy. No, I'm not going to be happy later on. I'm going to be happy right now. You know, how many of you all can agree? I don't want to wait for some future date to receive the joy of the Lord. I want to receive it now. <laughs> I got a house that I'm renovating and I got on the market right now. Me and Tabitha, we lived in this house for about four, year, four years when we first moved to Orlando. And I saw that the market went way up. And I'm a little slow. I'm a little behind the curve. The interest rates are crazy. But I said, you know what? I put about $50,000 into this house. I'm ready to sell it and kind of get my equity out so I can do some other things with it. And so I'm $50,000 into the thing. And I said, I don't know what I'm going to price it. I priced it kind of high. Lo and behold, in like five days on the market, I got like five offers. And I took one that was a little bit below asking price. I'm like, ooh, that's what I'm talking about. All right. And um, they did a home inspection within about three days. And they sent me over a notice saying they wanted to cancel the contract. This was right in the middle of a live conference. Stephen Chandler was on the stage preaching. And I had my phone on, and I just got this message, we want to cancel. And it was like I got hit in the gut. I ain't hear nothing Stephen was preaching. That's why you shouldn't have your phone on. Come on, somebody. You shouldn't have your phone on when the word is going. I got to go back on YouTube to see what my friend was saying. I have no clue what the man was preaching. I was wrestling with Satan and his, and his brothers and them on this, on this road telling me, you see, I ain't never going to get that house. So that's what he was saying. And like, oh, Lord, you can murmur and complain. Lord, I'm a tithe. Lord, I've been living right. <laughs> all right, so I put the house back on the market. In three days, I get a full price offer, all cash. I said, the Lord is doing exceedingly abundantly above all I can ask, think, or imagine according to the power at work in me. I said, praise God is a restorer. Mm -mm -mm. I'm walking around this thing with natural joy. <laughs> Seven days go by, and the guy didn't put his earnest money in. I said, man, that ain't right. Call him, he starts dodging me all over the place. Don't want to do what he's supposed to do. I said, man, this might be a scam. <laughs> so I go ahead and put in the notice, you know what, I want to cancel the contract. We go ahead and cancel the thing. $50,000 into the thing, man, I'm like two weeks into it, I'm like, man, what am I going to do? So I decide, we decide that we're going to fix up the house some more. So I basically replaced the roof. I replaced the polybutylene pipes throughout the house. I don't know if y'all know what that is. It's this crappy pipe from the 19, 1990s, right? Replaced all the pipe. Anyway, it spent about $30,000 more. I'm 30 days into it. Now I'm about seventy-five dollars to $80,000 into this thing. No contract, no buyer, just put it back on the market. And I was tempted to say, man, I'll be happy when I sell this house. I was tempted. Listen, every single day, I'm like, I will be happy when I'm done renovating. I will be happy when I'm done with this house and I'm at the settlement. I will be happy. You know, and some people, we go through our whole life being happy later on. Like, think about it. You could go through the whole Thanksgiving, like sitting around eating turkey, thinking about a deal that you want to go through while you letting it steal your joy. I don't want to go through Christmas. So I made up my mind every day. I don't care what happens to the house. I'm waking up with the joy of the Lord for the joy of the Lord is my strength. 
Oh, my God. Listen, I don't care. I don't care if I got to move back in the house. I'm not going to let it steal my joy. I don't care if I got to sell it for a dime on a dollar, which I'm not, praise God, but I'm not going to let it lose my joy. Come on, say it. I don't care if they foreclose on me. Come get the doggone house, but you ain't going to steal my joy. I don't care if Hurricane Nicole come and blow the house down. I'm not going to let it steal my joy. True story, Nicole came through and blew all my screens out my pool. I'm like, Ian didn't even do that. Ian, the screen standing strong. Nicole come through, half the wind, blow all my screens out. I said, the devil is a liar, but I ain't going to let it steal my joy. <laughs> uh, sometimes you got to laugh at the devil's face. Come on. You go to work and people are talking. <laughs> I ain't going to let you steal my joy, devil. Come on, try it. <laughs> it's good. Sometimes you got to open up your mouth and laugh because laughter do it good like medicine. I'm being as practical as I can with you because this is everyday life. Think about some of you all. You let the devil steal your joy all the time. You get in traffic. Oh, here we go again. <laughs> like, it's Orlando. What you expect? <laughs> My wife is that stressed out driver. Like, she'd be, oh, I don't believe they did that. Like, I don't care what people do in traffic. You're, I just don't care. Like, I'm like just chilling. Like, that's my whole thing. I'm just chilling. I'm just driving. I'm trying to get where I need to go to. Some of y'all be so stressed by the root. And we got a message for you. It's coming. You better be here. It's coming. We got a message for you of how to enjoy everyday life. I'm talking about the, the rudimentary, mundane, routine stuff, like cooking for your family. Do you know that that can be worshiped to the Lord and you can actually enjoy it? Well, they want everything, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, like I'm a chef. <laughs> you can enjoy it, though. You got two options. You can either hate your life or enjoy it. You might as well enjoy it. Oh, I got to go to the grocery store again. Thank God you got a store to go to where food is on the shelf. I've been in nations where we don't have stores. I mean, I could go through the list of stuff. Y'all just got to keep coming, but I'm talking about coming to the place where you count it all. Not a little bit. You count it all joy. Would somebody say amen? amen. And if you really want to get good at joy, you need to look at the Apostle Paul because he, to me, was the joy man. Read the book of Philippians. This guy here, he's like shipwrecked. He's been laughed at, talked about, mistreated. <laughs> he has been left for dead. The Bible says that they stoned Paul so much that they thought he was dead. Watch this. He's laying on the floor with rocks all over top of him. The people who stoned him leave. He gets up out the rocks like, okay, let's go preach Jesus. That's crazy. That's crazy. Some of y'all would probably go, I mean, you, you, I, I don't know what you would do, but if you got stoned, I don't know if you would still worship Jesus. And watch what he says in 2 Corinthians 12 as the apostle of some joy. He says, because of the extravagance, and I'm going to read out of the Message Bible because it gives us a message. Because of the extravagance of those revelations, and so I wouldn't get a big head, I was given the gift of a handicap to keep me in constant touch with my limitations. Satan's angel did his best to get me down, but what he in fact did was push me to my knees. No danger then of walking around high and mighty. At first, I didn't think of it as a gift, and I begged God to remove it. Three times I did it, and he told me, my grace is enough. It's all you need. My strength comes in its own in your weaknesses. And once I heard that, I was glad to let it happen. Mm. I quit focusing on the handicap, and I began appreciating the gift. It was a case of Christ's strength moving on my weaknesses. Now I take limitations in stride, and with good, what? The joy of the Lord. These limitations that cut me down to size, abuse. Ever been abused? Accidents. Anybody ever been in an accident? Opposition. Bad breaks. I just let Christ take over. And so the weaker I get, the stronger I become. I'm talking today about joy in a jam. And in closing, I want to give you five keys or five steps um, to what you do with or how to have joy in a jam. Y'all ready for these? Number one, how to have joy in a jam. You got to keep your eyes focused on Jesus because he is our joy. All right. Once again, 
We have to honor his house and honor his word. Will anybody here make a choice to live that way coming into this new year? That you are going to honor his house. Anybody? Thank you for those three, four hands. And honor his house, honor his word. Okay? I believe in the atmosphere joy can be received. Number two, stop over-focusing on the pain that you're in. I think sometimes we focus too much on our problems and not enough on the promise and the promise keeper. And you need to shift your focus. Somebody shout, shift my focus. Shift your focus. Things are not as bad as what you think they are. Stop focusing on the pain. Stop focusing on the promise keeper. Number three, don't be caught off guard by difficulties you face. Let's normalize those. People get married and they be like, well, pastor, I don't know something wrong with my marriage. It's so hard. No, it's marriage. And that's what it is. It's hard. Two people coming together, trying to cohabitate for the rest of their life. Same dreams, same vision, raise up these crazy kids. That ain't easy, but it can still be done. And we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Does anybody still believe the word of God today, no matter what you're facing in your house? All right? But you need to stop acting as if something's abnormal. So, man, I mean, these kids, these kids are so, yeah, it's hard being a parent. I get on Instagram, I see people lying. The kids matching. The kids, man, I can't get my kids up out of bed to get to church on time. I mean, it's just hard. But we've been created for hard things. Anybody here believe that you've been created for hard things? Like, if it's in your life, you can take it. If God be for you, then who can be against you? And number four, you got to cut off the joy thieves in your life. Some of y'all, you need new friends. I am not lying to you. I am telling you the truth. And I know they've been your ride or die. They've been there for you when you really needed them. But now they're just bringing you down. They bring you down into their drama. They bring you down into their sin. And every time you with them, you end up messing up. Oops, I did it again, Britney Spears. And you're going to have to get you some new friends that are living holy, that love God, that will prophesy over your potential, that will lead you in the right way. And I know it might hurt, but it's worth it. Come on, somebody. You need some people that are filled with the joy of the Lord. That when stuff is going crazy and people are fighting over social injustices, they still don't let nothing steal their dance. They still got a cheerfulness in their heart because I'm in this world but I'm not of this world. I'm not from around here. I'm an ambassador of Christ and I don't think like you think and I don't behave like you behave. I'm going to respond differently because he who is in me is different than anybody that you've ever met. Do I got any help in this church today? You got to cut off the joy thieves from your life. There are people that Satan has assigned to bring you down. There's people in your life that are spies. I got that from a rap song. No. <laughs> These people, as soon as you get married, they're going to hate on you. As soon as you get promoted, before they get promoted, they're going to hate on you. You don't need no spies that are just waiting to talk you down when God is doing something good in your life. You need some people that are going to rejoice with you and have the spirit of peace and joy when you're down. They're going to lift you up. I got to move on. I wish somebody would help me at this last service. And number five, you got to retain a thankful heart. And I really believe that an attitude of gratitude will heal so many people from depression, sadness, and despair. If you just got crazy grateful, if you just got crazy grateful, we're going into Thanksgiving season. Is anybody thankful? It, oh, man, y'all too weak with your clap. I don't know. I'm just, I'm just, I don't know. You don't know what I got going on right now. All this preaching and sweating in this hot raincoat, and you're going to clap like, like we watching the golf channel. You better give God. Is anybody thankful in this church? Do I got anybody that's thankful to be alive? Anybody thankful we got a building? Anybody thankful that you're in the land of the living? Anybody thankful that God has forgiven you, chosen you, hand-selected you from your crazy family? Is there anybody in this place thankful that you're in your right mind, all them drugs you did, all them people you done slept with, but your body's still for the Lord, and he cast your sin as far as the east? Is anybody in this place thankful for a great pastor and a great church? Anybody else thankful for small groups? Anybody else thankful for the word of God, the blood of God, the cross, the resurrected power of God? Anybody thankful for the name that's above every name? The name. 
Come on, I dare you. Don't pity pat today. I dare you. I dare you to praise God like he's worthy of your praise. Let everything that have breath. I don't know about you, but I thank God. I thank God. Not just for Thanksgiving, but I thank God for being able to see another day. For having breath in my body. Come on, I got fingers that I can move. I got eyes that I can see. I got feet that I can move. I don't have, my house still ain't sold, but thank God I had a house. I had the money to remodel. I got somebody that God's raising up right now about to put an offer in on it. Praise God. I thank God for my wife. She's not dead, but she's alive. She preaching in Gainesville right now. I thank God for you, sister, and you, pastor. I thank God. Oh, come on. I got anybody? Oh! You turn me around. You place my feet on a side. I gotta hear you today. Y'all know I got my mic. The hey! Because he healed my heart and changed my name. Forever free. I'm not the same. I think the master. I think the savior. I got any dancers here today? Come on. To the, come on. To the get side. Up, get up out of that grave. Hey. Get up, get up, get up. Get up out of that grave. Don't stay. Get up, get up, get up. Get up, get up out, out of depression. Get up out of discouragement. Come on. Get up out of sadness. That is not your, that's not your purpose. Come on. Get out of hatred. Come on. Get out of it. Come on. Get out of it with your praise. Come on, get, get out of worry. Of get out of get doubt. Up, get, up, get come on. Hey, get up, he picked me up. He picked me up. You turn me around. You place my feet on solid ground. I think the master. I think the shame. Oh, y'all sound good now. Because he killed my heart. It changed my name. Forever free. I'm not the same. I think the master. Let me see you march like you're going somewhere. Do I got any children of Jericho? Marches in this place. Get up, get up, get up. Get up out of that grave. Get up, get up, get up. Get up out of that grave. Come on. Get up, get up, get up. Get up out of that grave. Get up, get up, get up. No music. Hey, let me hear you. Come on. Sing. Get up, get up, get up. Get up out of that grave. Get up, get up, get up. Hey, get up out of that grave. You sing it. Get up. Don't wait on me. If God's been good for, to you, this is a time for you to praise him. He'll give you a garment of praise for a spirit of heaviness. He'll take your ashes and give you a crown of beauty. Come on. He wants to replace the spirit of mourning with the spirit of the oil of joy in this house today. Oh, we worship you. We worship you. Oh, we worship you, we worship you. We worship you, we worship you. Do I got any worshipers? A short day here. A short day here today, maybe. Short day, no? Are you here? I hope. Okay, come here real quick. I hope it's the right short day. You got Harry though, because. Short day, I said Harry. You're not Harry. Girl, I said Harry. Come on up the stage, girl, quick. 
We on live TV, girlfriend. You better come on. Talking about some hallelujah. To worship you, I live. Yes. To worship you, I live. To worship you, I live. I live to worship you. Come on and lift your voice and say. you're going to through, I choose to worship you, to Lord, worship yeah. come on, let's say it again, to worship you, to worship you yeah. with the right posture, to Lord, I give you glory, to yeah, you. when there's nothing else to say, what we say, oh, healing in the house today I believe God is going to confirm I believe that God is going to confirm his word I believe that God is going to confirm his word with signs following and in the presence of Yahweh God most high and in the name that's above every name the Lord Jesus the Lord showed me a few things that he wanted to heal today number one with someone who's had hip problems or maybe even a hip replacement if that's you, could you just place your hand on your hip? And in the name of Jesus, we call you healed right now. Pain leave, swelling leave, joints line up. The Lord gave me a word vertebrae. Someone's been having a problem in their vertebrae. I'm hearing the word 17. I don't know what that means, but we call you healed. Come on, just do like that if this is you. In Jesus' name, we speak over your vertebrae and the problems that you've been experiencing, and we call you healed right now. In Jesus' name, the Lord gave me the word epilepsy, and I had to look it up earlier because I forgot what it was, but I believe that God wants to heal someone that's been dealing with epilepsy or even seizures that come and go. So if that's you, lay hands on yourself like this because truthfully, when you get home, you don't need the prayer team to lay hands on you. You don't need a worship team. You need to lay hands on yourself in the name of Jesus and take authority over your home and your mind and your emotions. And so we just speak and we cancel the enemy's assignment that has been named epilepsy, we command you to loose and leave God's people right now and we call you healed 
from the throne of your head to the bottom of your feet. And the Lord showed me someone who was a parent with three children and you were stressing out and you almost feel bad, like guilty, because you're supposed to love your children and they kind of get on your nerves a little bit and they stress you out. And the Lord wants to replace your shame with double honor. And he wants to give you grace today, grace to endure. And I hear the Lord saying, listen, I hear the Lord saying that this is just a season. And it might be a year season or a five-year season, but he wants to give you grace for this season. If that's you, could you just lift a hand like this? All my parents, if that's you, Father, in Jesus' name, I pray supernatural grace over that woman who felt like giving up, over that man who felt like throwing in the towel, over parents that feel like bad parents, and we counsel the lie of the devil in the name of Jesus, and we declare they are loved by you, protected by you, honored by you, and you will give them supernatural grace for the season of raising children in their house, and we give you the praise for it. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. If you don't mind, nobody moving, if you, if you don't mind just for a moment, I want to give you the greatest opportunity that could ever be given to a human being, and that's to know their maker. We are all sinners, and we all deserve hell. Hell was never created for mankind. It was created for the devil and a third of the angels that rebelled against God. But God loves you enough that he will not make you love him. He gives you a choice. He says you can choose me or you can choose the place where I am not. Hell is not a place of punishment. It is the abstraction, the extraction of every characteristic of God. God is holy. He's love. He's mercy. He's grace. If you reject God, you go to the place where he is not. No man should go to hell. God loves you so much that he put his only son, Jesus, on a cross so that he could pay the price for every sin that we've ever committed in our life. He will not make you accept Jesus, but he will say, the day you hear my voice, don't harden your heart. And the Holy Spirit beckons men back to their father. I would love to pray with you a five-second prayer that could change your eternal address. With every head bowed and every eye closed, if that's you and you're here and you say, Pastor, I want a relationship with God. If you're here and you say, Pastor, I have sinned. <laughs> but I want to be forgiven of my sins. I want to pray for you. And on the count of three, I want you to boldly just lift up your hand and say, Pastor, pray with me. I'm going to acknowledge you. Then you can put it down. And so if that's you today, today is your day of salvation. Don't you let the devil steal it from you. And so if you're here today and say, Pastor, I want to be saved. I want a relationship with God. On the count of three, lift your hand. One, two, three. Lift it up high all over the place and just say, Pastor, Pray with me. Thank you. I see your hand and 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 your hand. Anybody else? It's not too late. Oh, I see your hand. Anybody else? Right there, I see your hand. Anybody else? I see your hand. I see your hand. Those online just put the word saved in the comments. Nobody prays alone. The Bible says the day that you call on the Lord, you shall be saved. Let's pray this prayer together. Say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart today. Forgive me of my sins. From this day forward, I surrender me, all of me, all of me. I give it to you. Do what you want to do. Lord Jesus, you're my Savior and my Lord. From this day forward, I'm saved. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Come on, can you put your hands together? Hey, thank you so much for tuning in to Alive Online today. I pray that message was a blessing to you. I pray that the Holy Spirit just takes something from it. And he illuminates it to where your life will never be the same again. If that's the case, make sure you let us know how your life was impacted and changed because of the message on today. We would love for you to share this content. You know, we have a saying in Alive Church that one invite can change a life. We also believe that one share can change a life. I mean, get your share on. God will use your share as a lifeline to reach people around the world. All right, if you like what we're doing here, we would love for you to be a part of our online family. You can do that by hitting subscribe. We want you to be the first to grab hold of all new messages and all new content as they are released. You know, the Bible says that when we give, It'll be given back to us. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. And one of the greatest ways that you can make a difference and change lives is by giving. And so if you would like to sow into the ministry of Alive Church, hit the button below. And I know that God will bless you, and you'll also be a blessing to other people. We love you, and we'll see you real soon. God bless you.